sound systems down in Bristol. Um, and the Brunswick that you're all gonna build today. So starting off with uh, this circuit board. Um, this was done uh, as a collaboration with these guys, Beef, uh, who are a Bristol, is it Experimental and Expanded Film Society? And they put on loads of interesting events. And if you're ever down in Bristol, see if they're doing anything. Uh, but they asked whether we could do a like DIY kit synth workshop with them. We said, yes, definitely, that'd be awesome. And we kind of set quite a low price uh, entry-wise. Um, and it was kind of a, a bit of a challenge to see what we could get out of not, you know, not a huge amount of electronics. So what you're going to build today is pretty much a, an entire synth voice. It's got like a, a single oscillator, uh, multi-mode filter. So that's the VCF. Uh, you've got VCA to control the loudness. That is so difficult to point on this thing. It's like, where's my finger going? Let me just do it on the paper. That's easier. Um, You've got a really basic envelope, so you can, you know, actually play a note and get a, some kind of slope out of it. You've got an LFO if you want to do like vibrato and PWM and stuff like that. Uh, you've also got this phase comparator and phase lock loop, which is part of the chip that we're using for the VCO. Uh, they're a bit wonky; they they kind of have to be pushed into working, but they kind of give you some interesting options in terms of modulation and sound sources and things that will playing a bit so um yeah the kind of actual synth i'll give you a quick demo of what it can do um you've got 24 points on the patch bay they're all kind of normal together a lot of them so you can hopefully just switch it on bring the vca bias up and you start getting a sound through the filter so as you can hear, the filter's pretty aggressive, pretty mad. Uh, you've got the pulse wave there with the PWM working. Um, the VCA is being triggered on the envelope here. So again, you'll see on the signal diagram that the way uh, the envelope gate over here is normaled, uh, it's being triggered by the LFO without anything plugged into it. So you can kind of get it to play itself there and then change the rate of what is being played, essentially. But ideally, you kind of want to end up plugging this into like a, well, getting a sequencer to control this or a keyboard or something, and it would be far more interesting. Um, and I guess last thing to say is that everything is kind of bust uh, control wise on these like FM one and two uh, channels. And channel one is your LFO, and channel two is the envelope. Again, it's all on the signal diagrams. Has everyone got one of those, or did we? Um, is there a bottleneck on. somewhere? I need to hop around. Uh, shall I pass the uh, schematics that way? Oh, I see yeah, I think it, I think it, yeah, got halfway around. Um, that's all right. Um, so, yeah, um, we'll kind of answer questions as we go, I guess, but it's that's pretty much the, the heart of the, the synth is just this basic VCO, VCF, VCA setup. Uh, if anyone's kind of unfamiliar with the VC um, naming of things, that's just for voltage control. So we're in the analog domain. There's no digital control of anything here. Everything's done with the voltage. Um, and I think that's pretty much everything to say about the general kind of layout of it. You can plug things into this. So when you take it home, if you've got like a Eurorack system, that will play happily with this. Uh, you can chuck external audio through the filter. You might need a bit of a kind of preamp stage to drive it quite hot, but it will work. Uh, same with the VCA. Uh, so it's all it's all happy being you know controlled by other things and other stuff. Has anyone got any questions yet? Just from the intro alone. Yes. How far is the walkthrough for the electronics that's going to be? Am I going to know what resistor is doing what? Yeah. It won't be. It won't be. It won't be that detailed, but we're pretty much going to break down like each kind of individual part of the schematic. So let's let's get this out of the way first, uh, and then have you got a? Is there any schematics anywhere? Oh no! Can I borrow one? Thank you. So 
yeah, everyone should have a schematic in front of them. This is going to be really fun to... Oh, it's a bit of a juggling job. Yeah, maybe. That might be great, Steve, actually, if you could. Uh, shall I... Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So I guess we'll start off with um, the VCO. So the VCO is based around this 4046 chip. Um, and what this is, is this kind of belongs to the 4000 series of, of logic chips. So anyone kind of looking at getting into electronics, definitely have a look at the 4000 series because there's a bunch of really interesting uh, kind of based within digital signals. So you're, you're working with, with complete binary, just high and low square waves, essentially. Um, but they can all do quite interesting things. So there's there's things like decade counters in there, and you can build sequences from those, and and Johnson counters, I think, that will do kind of like uh, subdivisions of incoming signals, so you can get different octaves and clock divisions and things like that. Um, but this forty forty six chip is a is a phase lock loop. Oh, has that has the camera gone to sleep, Steve? <clears throat> Um, it's good if you're coming from a world of like understanding the theory of, you know, of, of how synthesis works. Yeah, because they they're basically trying to make as ideal as possible, you know, all those different things you might have in logic, um, like logic gates and things like that. Yeah, um, so they're just can, really nice building blocks, aren't exactly, they? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. been building parts to implement. Yeah, those kinds of ideas. So, and then you have a few like this one's one of the kind of from the sort of more expanded range where they try to do more complicated things. Inside yeah. Them. Like this whole thing. It's easy to find info. Yeah, yeah, it's all really easy. The be yeah, what they all do, and they go from just being like you know logic gates to being this kind of thing. Which yeah, is quite an elaborate, you know, intense. Yeah. yeah, but then there's still like pennies to pick up. So yeah, you know, you can get these for like seventy p or Farnell or whatever, and then you know the stuff that you have to put around it is also very inexpensive and yeah. and simple. So. Um, and it's worth saying there's there there was a guy called Stanley Lunetta who uh, built a load of kind of systems based around these. So you find these like Lunetta synths online. Uh, is it Electro Music yeah. Forums? Yeah. Yeah. That place. Um, it's worth checking out that website, Electro Music, because they have like a massive forum just dedicated to people, kind of sharing these 4000 series circuits and saying, oh look, you could use this as a filter or a VCA or whatever, and there was a bunch strange. getting abused in some situations as well. Yeah, yeah. Because you, once you know what's inside them, you can then start to like use what the circuitry is. But if you know what the circuitry is inside, you can then use it to do other strange things. Yeah. Um, so anyone who's uh, come across the WASP filter, uh, the filter of the WASP synth is based around, a, uh, I think it's the 4066, which was like a, an analog switch. And Chris Huggett was using like the switch elements as like voltage controlled resistors, I think. I think that's how it works. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, so yeah, you can do some really It's very strange. Yeah. Rad stuff. You, do them the, you do things with them the wrong way around. Yeah. Is it like an analog switch is usually just a transistor pulling something to ground. So you treat it like that. Yeah. And then you treat it, but. Yeah. Even though that's not what it is. And it's a really, it's just a really cheap way of getting that stuff in a nice little package. So yeah, anyway, um, so you've got this 4046 chip here, and there's, anywhere you see these blue crosses, that, that just means it's not connected. So like pin 12 there, for example, we're not using that and various other bits. Um, but what this gives you is you've got this capacitor here, C2, um, and what the chip will do is it will use that capacitor, charge it up, discharge it, charge it up, discharge it to create a square wave. So what capacitors are is that you've essentially got two plates uh, and a dielectric between them. And you use the capacitive properties of that configuration to store charge and, and discharge it. So this gives you kind of like a... a um, it's quite strange how it's controlled. You get this kind of like rising ramp and then it's really quickly discharged and then you get a kind of timing gap and then it starts again. So you can actually see on the circuit board, which we'll pass around, if you could uh, take one of these and pass it on, uh, you'll see on the shape switch, 
uh, you the sawtooth wave isn't exactly saw. It's kind of like a ramp, and then you've got this flat bit. Um, and that is tapped off from this capacitor here, C2. Um, Oops, sorry. Yeah, all good? Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, what this chip then does with that um, kind of cap that's charging up and discharging is it will somewhere give you a square wave out. So I believe that's on pin four. And then that goes to some other gubbins there that we'll explain in a moment. So is everyone kind of following that concept of this cap charging and discharging? It's worth saying as well that in a lot of kind of analog VCOs, you use that same um, kind of idea to generate a pure saw wave. So just a rising ramp or decaying ramp. Um, and then you put that through a load of different wave shapers to make all of your signals. So yes. Just a quick question. So the only yeah. thing actually coming out of this chip is such as you've got some little pulses and then using the capacitor to get the actual chip. Kind of. So that we use um, we're using pin four as the kind of pulse wave output. And then we're tapping off from that capacitor um, like the, the sawtooth-ish wave. Yeah. That, yeah. that isn't normally an output from that chip. Yeah. That capacitor. It's actually that capacitor is used to tune the like the, the way, VCO, the way that, that yeah. chip is that chip is designed to compare the phase of two waveforms yeah. and give you a, an error signal. And that is part of the tuning circuit of, of the internals of it. So we shouldn't you shouldn't be taking that really. That's not usually an output. Mm. But we because there's a there's a waveform <laughs> there that tracks with the main VCO output, so we can yeah. use it. So we just we, we take it, we so it's, it's worth saying, like down here, this is the circuit that kind of allows us to do that. So, this is U7B. Uh, and what U7 is that's a TLO74, that's a quad op amp uh package, I guess, or IC. So, these op amps you'll see them kind of everywhere. There's this like triangular symbol with the positive and negative nodes on. Um, and we can use these in a variety of different circuits, uh, most typically just used as like gain stages. Um, what we're doing here with it is we're, we're using this as a buffer. So this allows us to um, essentially tap off from that capacitor without disturbing its charge and discharge cycle. If we just took that to like straight out to a jack, as soon as you plugged into that jack, the VCO would just stop because you'd start drawing current from, well, away from the capacitor. So this lets us uh, just amplify that signal. Uh, barely any current is drawn there, so the cap stays happy. And then we pass this through another capacitor here. Uh, and what this capacitor in series does, this is C5, um, this actually kind of removes the DC component from the signal. So at the moment, uh, from the output of this op amp, we've just got like a positive only signal going between the, the positive supply rail and zero. Um, what this does, this tries to, this capacitor tries to center that waveform around zero. Yeah. So that's kind of what we want in most audio signals. So yeah. Essentially. Yeah. 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 So. So uh, a capacitor will, if you've got a capacitor in series, it will act as a, a high pass filter. So you're just kind of removing, if you've got like a large capacitance, it'll remove uh, low frequencies uh, and then let kind of higher frequencies pass through. And then supporting the frequency. Not really. So we're, we're saying like, say if you had, um, Ideally, if you tried to pass like 10 hertz through this capacitor, we'd be blocking it because we're what we're using this capacitor here to do is only pass audio. So anything from, for example, 10 hertz downwards, it just kind of essentially rejects and will only pass at the uh, kind of like secondary plate, I guess, where it says from saw. It will only pass the frequencies above that point. D does that make sense? Well, I don't understand what is it about the nature of the capacitor that doesn't let the DC part of the current pass through. So it, that it holds. It's it's because it's because where you're kind of charging and discharging it, yeah. you, I mean, you essentially just reject the DC, don't you? The DC's. Uh, this is hard so to describe you, now. Yeah. 
I mean, like you just treat a capacitor as ideally not passing DC in series, and the way that works, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I mean, it's because it's part of a t essentially when you have a capacitance and any resistance, which there will be, you will have a circuit that has some sort of response frequency response that will reject. It's the it's the other stuff that makes it like it would never exist in isolation, but it's the resistance that's in parallel that will make it a circuit that has yeah. a time constant. So you can work out what that is, which basically describes where it should ideally start to um, reject frequencies. So, and when it's in the series configuration, it would be rejecting stuff that's towards DC. And when it's in the parallel configuration, it will reject stuff that's towards the... So we'll, we'll kind, we'll kind yeah. of see that in the filter. Like that's, that's almost getting into how this, this filter works. But yeah, it's kind of just, it's almost just treat it as a given. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. A lot of these things, you've got to treat them as, yeah. ideal, as, as ideally what they, what they should do. Like a, a capacitor shouldn't pass DC. In reality, that will pass some DC a because bit, it's going to yeah. be a, a circuit. I mean, none of these components are ideal. An op amp as well, just wanted to say, op amps are like, they're an ideal kind of design object. Mm -hmm. So they're not yeah. so inside the chip that is an op amp. There'll be a massively complicated transistor circuit that tries to make itself behave like that. Like we've all agreed that will behave <laughs> in electronic design, if you, if you like. Yeah. So you can use that. You can configure it in different ways, but all that's kind of like abstract in the design world. And then you try and build a physical thing that does that. Mm. The op amp, some of the things it does, it doesn't draw, or it draws like almost no current into its non-inverting input, mm. into its inverting input. So that's what allows it to let you separate circuits from each other. Um, so like Vinny was saying, if you put, if you plug that in that, that the top of that capacitor into something else in your Euro rack, it, it'll have some electrical characteristic that might just pull that to make that, make that not drawing up too much current for that, that that can supply and it will just, you'll have no signal there. Mm -hmm. So the op amp, the fact that it doesn't draw any current allows you to, you know, separate that from whatever happens afterwards. So, and then you can use it for lots of different things because you do that later as well. Like yeah. LFO, it can do kind of logic things as well. It can compare signals. Um, but yeah, but I just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that okay, kind of generally? You, you have to kind of, some of this, you just have to, yeah. I don't know. I'm, not it's, uncomfortable, I'm not uncomfortable treating the off-amp as a black box because it doesn't okay. things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 kind of yeah we'll get into that in in again the later sections we kind of use it differently. So and we can talk about how things are also not working ideally. Yes. As well. Yeah. Like that capacitor thing. All of it's kind of all of it's the not best ideal. Out of all batteries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, there's a bit of DC there. How can we get rid of it? Oh, we could do this. That this kind of works, but it has a minimal effect on what we're trying to do. Yeah. Let's leave that in. Kind of thing. So kind of saying that that is the core of our oscillator will then just, just kind of shift ahead to this part of the circuit and again I, i'm not going to get too deep into this because we'll be here for a long time but this this does the essentially the linear to the exponential conversion of the pitch signals so here you've got you can see that you've got two vco fm inputs and your one volt per octave input and the kind of idea behind most VCOs, at least in sound synthesis, is that if we're creating a tone, if we're creating a musical tone, so we hear in a logarithmic scale, I guess. So say if you had A at 110 hertz, the octave above that is 220, octave above that is 440, octave above that is 880. So you're doubling every time. If you related that to like a, a pitch control voltage, that's going to make things quite difficult because then you end up, say, um, your first couple of octaves in the voltage range, you're going to need uh, very low noise and very good um, kind of handling of, of small signal levels to be able to reproduce that control signal well. And then obviously the, the voltage will then shoot up as you double every time. So you, you get to quite silly you know, uh, voltage scales if you had like a, an exponential uh, relationship there. So that's why we keep it linear for the most part. I'd realize that there are some synthesis signs <laughs> that work on exponential control uh, signals, but they tend to not, I, in my experience, they're not as precise as actually doing this, doing it this way and doing it well. Um, so what we do is we, we take that 
uh, signal there, and we, we're just using this op amp here as a, this actually does invert the signal. So you can see that the, the control um, buses go into pin two of this op amp. And can you see that's the negative node? So that is the inverting input to that op amp. Um, and we have a resistor between the output and the uh, inverting input, which will set a, a gain uh, so that it's the relationship between that resistance uh, in the loop and the input resistors there which set your gain. So that tends to be um, RF, which is the feedback resistor, over the resistance of the input. Yeah. Uh, so you can see that if you've got 1K5, so that's 1,500 ohms, you treat the K as a decimal point, essentially. Um, and then 10K, this is 10,000 ohms, you're going to have 1,500 over 10,000. So you're actually attenuating this uh, by well, quite a big degree. The, the gain is going to be very, very small. Yeah. So... Um, we then pass that signal into this pair of transistors, which they essentially do all of the work here. So they convert this um, linear signal into kind of having a, a, an exponential current relationship then. So you start to get this nice um, exponential scale out, and then we can take that out through that uh, expo tag there uh, on the collector of that trans uh, transistor, then into this pin here on the 4046, which again isn't really supposed to be uh, current input. That's that's supposed to set, um, again, I think a, a frequency scale between pins 11 and 12, but it's nice that you can do that with this and use it as a voltage controlled oscillator through this kind of setup. Is that kind of making vague sense? I don't want to get too deep into that because, again, we'll, we'll be here for ages. But is that cool? Yeah. So, again, it is worth saying that the, the most important thing with, with this circuit is that you keep um, these transistors, you, you try and match them as much as possible. So this kind of goes back to the idea of having ideal components. Um, any transistors, you pick them out from the tape, they will have slightly different gains, slightly different uh, kind of resistances between uh, the terminals. And really, you want to have as similar as possible uh, characteristics between these two transistors so that you get a very good, um, I guess, linear to exponential relationship in this converter. Yeah. Uh, so when people talk about the tracking of VCOs, it's often this circuit that they actually are commenting on. Uh, and you can see we've got a little trim pot somewhere on this schematic. Um, where's it gone? Maybe it's not. Oh, there it is. There it is. So you've got a little trim pot there, which is VR15, just after the one volt per octave input and that's essentially setting the gain of the one volt per octave uh, channel if you will so you can get the relationship you can play kind of you know a couple of octaves up your keyboard and what is produced by the oscillator corresponds to those octaves rather than just being like yeah okay it's ascending in pitch but it's ascending by two octaves each time I play an octave or whatever you know so you kind of have to get that bit right of the circuit, the gain, the gain structure, and then you also have to get the transistors matched. Is that okay with everyone? Everyone following that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then kind of going back to the VCO, once we've made our kind of sawtooth and our um, pulse waves out here, uh, we've got this little section of the circuit, which actually um, is kind of doing the pulse width modulation. So what we're doing here, we're taking that square wave, we actually feed it through a capacitor um, simply because that made it more interesting. That is, that is all I can really say about that. We tried it with and without, and that just gave a better PWM response. It sounded cool. Yeah, essentially. Um, again, there are various facets of doing this kind of design where you just have to say, that sounds cool, let's just leave it. It doesn't really make much electronic sense for us to actually do that, but it, 
it was just better at the time. So the one effect that it will do again is kind of remove DC. So you can see that where this chip is powered just from the nine volt and ground rails, you're only alternating be between zero and nine. You're not you're not going from minus nine to plus nine. Whereas yeah. yeah, whereas this this op amp here is is powered from minus nine and plus nine. So what we do here is we're actually kind of we do remove a little bit of DC offset in order for this to work as a comparator now and to say, OK, well, the square wave is is kind of just going below zero volts. Let's hit the negative rail. And then when it goes above zero volts, you hit the positive rail. OK, so you've now got like a bipolar signal centered around zero volts. So that square wave goes in there through is it R1, yeah, R100K. And, and you can see this time the feedback loop of the op amp. Um, so the inverting node to the output, we've only got a capacitor there. There's no resistance. So this means that the op amp is working at pretty much open loop gain. Uh, so that's really, really, really high gain. So it will just square whatever goes in and hit, try and hit as close to the rails as possible. Um, and with that signal, we also mix in uh, VR10, which is the manual pulse width control and the PWM. And what those do is they, they add a bias to that incoming square wave to then say like, okay, well, you should be hitting the positive rail more so than the negative rail, or you should be hitting the negative rail more so than the positive rail. And that is what gives you the varying pulse wave. Does that make sense? Sort of yeah. Skewing the yeah, essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, kind of what say if you had like a sine wave, a low frequency sine wave on top, what you would see at the at the input of that op amp is essentially that square wave superimposed on that sine wave. But because we're then using this op amp as a comparator, it's just squaring it off again. And because you're biasing that input square wave, you change the pulse width essentially. It's kind of a really neat, almost like XY transform thing, because what comes out isn't necessarily particularly obvious as to what's going in when you look at it on a scope, but you can kind of hear the effect. Is that making sense? Yeah, vaguely, yeah, ish. Um, okay, so we then take that through the shape switch, and we just switch between the from saw output of this op amp over here, trying to put my fingers in the right place, um, and the square wave, uh, the pulse wave that's coming out there. Oh my god, <laughs> it's really tricky. Then again, we feed it through another capacitor just for good measure to try and remove any final DC offset that might be there and get uh, a vague uh, bipolar signal from that pot that is then variable. Is that making sense? All good? Yeah. Uh, it's worth saying, yeah, we, we tap off the two waveforms as well. So they're, they're, they're as individual waveforms on the patch bay. All good? People following? Yeah? OK. Uh, it's kind of an endless problem in this Yeah. because of the way that it's powered. Yeah. Because as the batteries deplete, so it draws more current on the positive rail than the negative rail. So as the batteries are used, you'll have more voltage on the negative rail. So the whole thing's going to come down slightly. So. DC is like a constant problem. That's yeah. Why using lots of capacitors yeah, so to try and stop just, that from causing yeah. problems with, yeah. with you know, instability and everything like that. But it's, yeah, it's like a, it's never ending with this kind of design because of the power supply and the simplicity of it. So if it's a, to like take your profession, so you can't overuse the capacitors. So this could do is just make sure that like, <clears> each bit of the circuit, the right amount of like, uh, the, the voltage range is going. In a synth, through. in a synth, yeah. It's yeah. Also, so. <laughs> if you're building like an like a EQ or a, or a micro or something, then you might want to worry about it limiting the bandwidth yeah. of the amplifier. But in an in a synth, you can use them pretty sparingly. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's it's it is worth saying as well. Like the the kind of classic effect that you get from from having that DC offset is when you know plug the patch cable in and you get a massive pop. Mm -hmm. So you might experience that a little bit with this. I mean. Again, hopefully it's minimized, but there will be, you know, maybe a couple of things where you shove it in and it's like, bam, oh, okay, you know. But we've we've tried to minimize that as much as possible. Um, another different a way, another way of doing it would be 
So we're powering the op-amps in like the normal way you would power an op-amp. It likes to have a bipolar supply because it's trying to, its output is designed to kind of go above and below um, the average of the two supply voltages. Mm. So it, it's ideally you'd put it so that the zero is the average and it would just be a waveform that centers around zero. And in guitar pedals, you often find where they've used op-amps, they'll have a single nine volt battery, but they'll they'll bias all the all the op-amps with a pair of resistors so that it's, everything is happening where the zero point is half of nine. And then at the end, they take that component away. But we haven't done that. We've tried to make a bipolar supply from two batteries. Yeah. And that's why it's all to, to reduce- Varying the results. You have, you'd have to have at least two resistors on every, or one resistor on every op-amp yeah. to make that work. And then don't you get the repetition of the zero? Uh, yeah, it would be a lower lower maximum level. But yeah, it's true. Only, it's only yeah. half. So in audio, it's, it's only 6 dB voltage. So that kind of thing, whilst it sounds like a big number, it's yeah, it's difference between bad, 4 yeah. and 9 and 9 and 18. It's, yeah. it's not that. It's not it's huge. It's not huge, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, there's a lot of kind of slight hacks at this thing. So um, if you wanted to make it like a guitar pedal, then you would have had resistors everywhere. But everywhere, yeah. That would have been however many more resistors for you to solder in. So. Yeah. And we but also kind of like the idea of, of having this like bipolar, because bipolar supplies are like, you know. A bit of a holy order, grail, or, yeah. 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 <laughs> order, desk, whatever. Just as funny to have them, it's just two nine volts that are back to back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the kind of thing, it's like, um, you know, maybe every other session, if you happen to take the batteries out of this thing, just swap them over. Just so that you're trying to kind of yeah. average out the uh, supply voltage on each, but again, after like eight hours of running, you'll find one battery will probably be like half a volt, yeah, different than the other, yeah. Um, <laughs> so. yeah. You know those adapters you get that let you run sort of nine volt only guitar pedals. Uh, War yeah. warp, yeah. 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 If you use those, would that affect in any way? Be... So you can't if you. Uh, tried to connect a couple of warts as like two nine volt supplies together. They they won't be very happy. You'll yeah. you'll run into all sorts of problems. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't what you that. what you can use is you can use a um, like DC to DC converter chip or brick or whatever to. Um, it's kind of like hidden magic. They'll use a some buck boost converter to take like twelve volts in, and then they spit out plus minus nine, so you get two rails at the slightly lower voltage. Uh, and I think right at the end of the build manual, did we mention about that, Steve? Like there's, yeah, there's, there's recommended part, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. And we we might bring out something that will hook up with this and yeah. other things and, and work well. But yeah, for the for the moment, it's certainly not recommended that you just, you know, two wall warts and straight in. You'll... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Well, well, we'll move on to the filter next. So... Um, I guess we'll just start with the most boring bit. Um, you have these these two circuits here, which look quite similar. They're just essentially the, the voltage control for the VCF and the VCA. Um, it's essentially the same circuit. It's it's a um, just a, a kind of summing amplifier here, so we can mix, um, you know, various control inputs together. Um, and control the gain of that and, you know, make sure it's all nice and happy and it's it's an active stage rather than just being a passive mix. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. It kind of looks more complicated than it actually is on the badly crammed together schematic. But once we've got that control signal for the VCF, where's my finger? Um, we feed that in there <laughs> for the... Uh, filter circuit, and this is this is quite an interesting thing. So, uh, has anyone got a pen? I might just do some drawing. You've got a pen. Um, oh, thanks, Sammy. I think we're all good, Jay. Sorry, Sammy beat you to it. So, if you if you want to make a filter, the kind of most common thing you'll find is this kind of thing. So you have a resistor and a capacitor. This is um, a low pass filter. It's called a like either a single pole or a first order filter because there's just one RC stage. And that gives you a 6 dB per octave roll off. 
So it's quite a, you know, shallow slope, I guess. And this is essentially the fundamental principle of any filter design that you'll come across. And this resistor and capacitor work together to create a reactance, essentially, which is kind of like a frequency-dependent impedance. So all you really need to think is that if you're varying, say if we've got this set to one kilohertz on the cutoff frequency. So if you feed in a hundred hertz into the input, uh, the reactants here will be happy for that to pass through. Whereas say if you're feeding two kilohertz, there'll be a higher reactance there and it will kind of impede it and, and take the signal to ground. So you won't you will pass less of that signal through. There'll still be a little bit because you're still working on the cutoff slope of the filter, but there won't be as much. And this, this kind of, um, I guess, network is present here. So can you see C9 and 10? They are the capacitors of, of this network, essentially. So what we've got is something similar to this. So... If we chain these networks together, we end up creating a uh, 12 dB per octave filter. And you can, you can stack as many as these as you want together. And as long as there's a, a buffer circuit at the end of it, you've, you've got a nice active filter. Okay. So again, I'll just fill this in with my terrible handwriting, R and C. Uh, you've got in and you've got out. So you can hopefully see here that C9 and 10. Uh, they they actually go back through this resistor to the output of the op amp. So they're doing something slightly more interesting than just going down to ground. But then we use these two yellow uh, rectangular things here as our resistors. And you might be asking, well, why, why aren't you just putting a resistor in there? And that's because we want some degree of control over the filter cutoff, right? It's a VCF. It'd be nice to make it go meow rather than just stick on the same cutoff. So these are two optofets. So the element that you're running through here is a FET, it's a field effect transistor, and it's actually controlled by, I believe this is an infrared LED, and this little element is sensitive to infrared uh, light within the casing of the chip. So you'll see on the Brunswick, uh, that's these things here, these funky white chips. Um, and that's all built within that kind of housing. I'm not sure whether it's on silicon or whether it's just a separate kind of constructed thing. Um, but this is handy because you can, you can use a FET um, as a voltage controlled resistor. Um, so you've got this kind of light here, so it's also sensitive to light. You're using the control signal to power up an LED. You can see very small there. And that's shining on the FET and it controls the amount of resistance there. So you're changing this R value here, which then changes the reactance. So it's changing the cutoff point of the filter. So you have a voltage controlled filter. Yeah? Is that making sense? Yeah. Is there a way through that? Is actually an LED on the circuit, or is there something happening inside of the circuit? There's, there's something happening inside. Uh, I think it probably is actually a light and an yeah. and and off sensitive effect. Yeah. Because they're, they're usually used where you want to have electrical isolation between two circuits. So mm. like I that, think. Like that, yeah, 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 similar. Yeah, like similar. The MIDI, the MIDI spec, for instance. Uh, requires that there is an opto FET on the MIDI data lines coming into the device. So you'll see a couple of those in every MIDI input now, uh, in every MIDI input, um, because they want to avoid problems of ground loops and things like that affecting the data lines. So usually they're designed for isolating data connections or for like you can't use not really for like electrical safety, but yeah, where you want to yeah. make sure you're not going to have any like ground loop pro problems or any other noise like that, with a with, with a signal. Yeah. So I imagine the only way you can do that is actually by having a light and a FET rather than something that's Anything silicon on silicon, yeah. Do the, same, do the same thing, yeah. Yeah. Just sorry, one more question. You're stacking okay. these up to get the steep cutoff, so you can sort of yep. keep stacking for more signal. Yeah, so say say if, you know, if we had the board space, really, it's more, it's more to do with just space in terms of the Brunswick, but... Um, 
if you oh this is badly drawn um mm. if you did this i mean if you if you had that then you'd have 18 db per octave and then if you did this you'd be at the kind of you know classic mogi 24 db uh proctive four pole thing so you can just keep chaining these up i mean in in a passive sense you get into all kinds of loading problems so you can't really do this without having an amplifier at the end hence this which is acting as a buffer and a kind of gain stage for the resonance um but yeah this this rc network allows you to do anything really so the other way that you can configure this is you can do the inverse in terms of the um, C and the R arrangement. And that gives you, well, can anyone guess what that might give you? Yes, exactly. So uh, this whole scenario with, with having the resistor in series with your audio uh, gives you a low pass filter because you're referencing the, the capacitor to ground. Whereas going back before, we were saying that you know, capacitors don't really want to pass uh, essentially lower frequencies. You can say that, well, if you've got your capacitor there and your resistor there going to ground, you've then got a high pass filter. Does that make sense? Yeah, people are nodding. Yeah, we're good. And you can actually see, um, it's kind of done, so this like, I think this is the Noel Steiner kind of layout. I'm, I'm still not completely sure what he's doing here. It's kind of magic, but the high pass input here, you kind of take it into the capacitor um, of that filter network rather than taking it directly into the FETs. Does that, can people see that? Yeah, vaguely. Yeah, ish. Again, I'm I'm a little bit unsure as to how he's really managed to fudge that, but it's quite interesting. And then the the band pass input goes up through the the center cap of that uh, network, which is interesting too. Uh, but it works. It works as a as a multi mode filter, and all the kind of inputs are available simultaneously. So you can do some interesting things with like, oh, you've got two different wave shapes in the high and the low pass. And then as you kind of filter between them, you get different sounds coming out. Yeah. Uh, so as for the resonance, the resonance is, is essentially um, working as a, as a feedback control here of the, of the gain stage of the op amp. So as you bring the gain up, I'm... I think what happens is you, you're essentially pushing more current through this part of the filter through back through kind of C9 and R56, which is a 10K there. Uh, so this gives you a pretty aggressive resonance. It's, it's, sometimes it almost sounds like oscillator sync. It's that kind of mad. Um, and once you start playing with these synths, you'll kind of hear that as well. And um, we also did the good old Korg trick of sticking a diode in the feedback loop to do some degree of uh, limiting as well. So a diode, uh, which typically looks like that, this is kind of like having an electrical. Lost the mic. Sorry, Steve. Sorry, everyone on Facebook. Just you know, probably destroyed some speakers. Hopefully. Um, this is um, this is like an electronic valve, so it only lets current pass one way. We electronic check valve. Yes, we're we're gonna we're gonna have a massive brain <laughs> problem about this. I don't know. So typically, this is this is your anode and this is your cathode. If you if you hear people talking about diodes, you'll often hear anode and cathode. And then the way I typically tend to think of this is that the anode is positive and the cathode is negative. But then if you think of it from an electron point of view, electrons are negatively charged and it all starts to fall apart. But don't worry about that. It's just It's extra confusion. Let us argue about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of what we're doing here is it's, it's a bit funky because 
we're actually only limiting the uh, signal one way. So it's super nonlinear and does interesting things. This is D6, sorry. Um, but the the diode will um, it will have like like uh, different voltage characteristics. So you kind of can only pass a certain voltage uh, one way, but then it's free to flow the other way. If that makes sense, it's a really simplistic view of it. But uh, so, but only having one in the one direction only does it in the one direction. So uh, we will eventually write into the user manual like there's a couple of things you could do to this filter if it's too aggressive for you. You can stick another diode in parallel with that, but backwards, and then you're limiting both ways, and it suddenly actually becomes a lot less aggressive. But we kind of like it like this. So it's the same. So we've left so, it. You know the Roland tube, uh, Roland. Cool. Oh, I've been tube screen there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same. They, that's how they do the clipping circuit in that as well. So they have two diodes, back to the one pointing one way, one the other, in the feedback loop, and mm. that that that, that clips what's in the feedback loop of the off amp, so it doesn't just absolutely clip it, but it does provide some rounding off of the waveform. So say if you had that going in, and you can get so diodes have different characteristics of where they will allow current to flow and not allow current to flow. So you can you know, different, there are different voltage thresholds. So you can also uh, like mix and match. You could have yeah. So t it tends to be like in a valve guitar amp when valves overload, they tend to distort asymmetrically. So you'll get a bigger positive or and smaller mm. negative going portion of the waveform. Mm. So you could get like one diode with a higher threshold voltage on the one side, and then in the opposite direction have one with a slightly lower threshold voltage. You can get a kind of like valvey distortion sound. Yeah. Because soft clipping like a wing of pipe. Function to the signal yeah. 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 Cool. yeah. And, actually, and actually, the diodes behave, even though they have a very absolute, when they're in with that absolute kind of threshold voltage where they will close, like stop conducting, when mm -hmm. they're in that configuration, they don't behave like that. There's, they do kind of soft well, clip. Yeah. It's not yeah. an absolute, like, oh, if it hit the threshold, bang. Yeah. Um, because it's mixed in with what's going into the other input of the off amp. Is, is the four one four eight as well, or just a, a type of type of diode? Yeah, that's like that's yeah, it's really common. Diode. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So yeah. it has a, a forward voltage of 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.7 volts. Yeah, so you can get ones that are like 0. 0.3 lower. You can get ones that are higher. Yeah, um, you can get one. Yeah, all sorts of different kinds it's of diodes. It's all over the threshold. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what would happen here, for example, like if you had a sine wave, say if we had if we did put in our imaginary diode there, just for the moment. Uh, you would end up kind of like clipping this off there. It, it'll be a bit smoother than as yeah. I'm drawing it. I'm drawing yeah. it quite it'll extremely. Be, but like that in the feedback loop, yeah. But the output of the op amp, because it's being mixed in with the original signal, yeah. it's much smoother. Yeah, so you kind of get a bit of it on your... Well, it's not mixed in, but you yeah. know what it does, what the op amp does. Yeah. Yeah. How wet, wet, dry controls work, tend to work better? Dry, dry and wet controls? Yeah. Uh, not so much with that. You're usually just using uh, like the so a potentiometer will have three lugs. Um, so re this pen is really handy. That's not the best invention ever. Um, so you could use this as like a level control. This, that's that's often how it's used. Is that you'll have you know your audio blah, 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 and then say ground here. So ground is going to be your zero volt reference, and then this will give you a, a essentially a crossfader between zero and your output. Yeah. So, but what if we if we got rid of that and said, well, actually, that's our signal on the other side is that scribble, and then the signal on the other side is that scribble. You can crossfade between the two scribbles and have a completely new scribble all of your own. Yeah. yeah? Does that make sense? With the diodes, I've seen. Yeah. Mm. So how simple slash difficult is it to do that? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you could you could just wire up like a. a well, you did that with your that. distortion pedal, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I made a tube screen based distortion where you could pick what is in the feedback loop. So you could so you could have an LED, LEDs have a higher threshold voltage, like one point four is red usually, mm. depending on the the chemistry of it. Um, but yeah, you can pick and choose. So you could have different asymmetries. And different clipping curves on the positive and negative side, and yeah, 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 yeah. There's some old 
old geranium diodes that, mm. that have very, very low, yeah. Do you need to do anything with like, like voltage stuff? Mm. Uh, if it's just a diode, I mean, it's, no, it's up to you, really. I would just do it by ear. Yeah. You know, in, that, in that situation, yeah. and you're trying to get a clipping sound that you like to sound off, just pick one that sounds good. Yeah. In combination with another thing, it's all design. I would say particularly for yeah for this kind of application, there's not really any point in matching them. Um, if you were doing like a diode ladder filter, which is something completely different, then yeah, maybe. But then it's funny because a lot of the characteristics of these kinds of things, particularly filters, all the interesting sonic uh, characteristics of them come from all the imperfections and all the slight mismatches anyway. So mm. I'd say don't bother. It's you know it's often it's often more interesting. Uh, are people happy with that? Yeah? yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, we'll just do the VCA really quickly. This is like the world's worst VCA. Um, so what we're doing, we're, we're taking audio from the VCF output. We're sticking it into this. This is another FET. So I don't know if you can kind of see, but this, the symbol in the Opto FET is kind of similar as to this FET too. Uh, but this isn't an OptoFET, this is, this is just controlled by current. So we take, if I step out of the way of the camera, whoa, trying to figure out what's left and right again. Uh, we take the output of the VCA there, uh, VCA control, sorry. And we pop that into uh, this node here through a resistor um, and into the gate there. All good. Um, and you've got the source and the drain either side of the FET. It doesn't really matter which is which in this case. You, you could essentially install this FET backwards and it really wouldn't make a difference. Uh, and we're trying again to kind of use this as a voltage controlled resistor, but we're also not really compensating for any of the nonlinearity of this JFET. So this will have a hard time passing, um, I believe, positive signals. So you're kind of, again, going back to our sine wave ideal, uh, you'll end up with something that kind of looks a bit like that. So the peaks are really, really quickly just obliterated completely. So this is why if I, uh, if I still got this set up, if I turn it on, that'll help. <laughs> You can kind of hear that you've got a bit of actually quite a lot of it there. Like that tone changes as you duck the VCA bias down. So it's more bass, and then more of a like kind of sound to it. Yeah, it's 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 like the timbre shifts. Um, so again, like you feed you feed an envelope into this, and it typically sounds like quite fizzy as it decays because you get this sound like bang. Because as it's as the FET is turning off, you get more of that clipping effect. So yeah. as, it's, as it's closing, you get that. That's why it sounds more bright at the end there, as it's just about to shut. Yeah. So it's like the waveform will just be squished. Yeah, and it yeah. becomes asymmetric as you get closer to to zero. Yeah. Shut. yeah. So yeah, so yeah, it's worth saying having this open just lets the the way this FET works. You have this uh, source and drain that are um, controlled by the gate here, and the 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 way that the FET is composed, the gate is literally pushing on a channel of electrons and stopping the flow, and then letting the flow happen and stopping the flow. So that's. Again, it's kind of it's kind of akin to like an electronic valve in in the way that you're then shutting this with another signal and letting it flow. It's a different kind of water valve, but thinking of it in water terms, which everyone seemingly does. Yeah, um, we then pop that through another capacitor to try and remove any DC offset again, and then just through a simple gain of one inverting amp uh, just to buffer it. Uh, we've set the gain here so the output is at line level. So we take all of this kind of like quite hot modular level stuff, take it down to vaguely line level so people can plug it into their audio interfaces and not be clipping everything all the time. Yeah? Presumably, the, is, the, uh, and is that the VCA out or is the VCA out at a higher level? So the, the VCA out is, is the line level output. Yeah. Level. Yeah. So again, 
with this setup here, like, so say this is our F, this is our N, your, let's just call it G, your gain is usually negative RF over RN on this kind of setup here. So if you wanted this to actually be at modular level, you could bring up that resistor, which is R36, to maybe 470K, and that would take your gain up by a factor of 4.7, and you'd be closer to modular level at the output there. Yeah? What's the no, it's just whether you want to take the output of that VCA straight into into your interface. We kind of designed this thinking like people will want to plug this straight into a speaker. Yeah, yeah. Because um, again, when we originally designed it, it wasn't really. It was designed as a gateway into you know synthesis and maybe modular synths, but people would probably end up plugging the output of this thing straight into their you know mixer or their little mini rig speaker or whatever you know. So, yeah, they're super hot. Yeah, they're they're like modular level. level yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, I mean, all you're really ever going to do is just clip something. It's it's you know, you'll just be super hot. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of designed to be as expandable as possible and. Yeah, we might be working on some things to maybe help that too. Um, the other bits to mention are the LFO down here and the um, envelope. So the LFO is just based around a couple of op amps, again, uh, nice and easy. And the, the way this kind of works is that we charge up uh, this capacitor in the loop of this amplifier. Uh, that gives us a nice uh, triangular um, LFO. And the, the output of that cap charging and discharging is took into this. Um, I guess you're kind of working this as a comparator to give you your square LFO, and that feeds back into that uh, charging and discharging. And you can control the, the kind of rate of current th flow through this uh, pot here. That changes the rate of the triangle and therefore the square too. Um, yeah. So the reason you've used this circuit here as opposed to how you're generating the VCO is, uh, is the LFO circuit not as good as saying trying to drive it into audio rate? Uh, so yeah, it's, it's mainly simplicity. So this was an easy way of just getting a, a triangle wave. So if everyone wants their you know, vibrato or their PWM, this is probably by far the easiest way of doing it. Um, it's just nice that you have to have this comparator here to, to kind of change the charging and discharging of the cap. So U7C. Uh, and U7C also gives you your square wave. So it's nice also having a square wave output, and then you can do things like trigger envelopes with it. Yeah? Um, audio rate, wouldn't that, 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 but that would become problematic, though. That, the idea of charging that cap and discharging would become problematic because you wouldn't get as much time for it to... <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't. It wouldn't, it wouldn't use yeah. less output as you went. But then faster. what you could do is you could change the capacitor value. So that's one microfarad, which is quite large. So you're going to build it for audio, audio yeah. You do that. You do, yeah, Go down to like 10N or something, yeah. 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 But it, it goes pretty fast. It goes to like about 10 hertz-ish, maybe, uh, down to fairly slow. So the rate response is a bit lumpy, but it's kind of as good as we can get it. So, yeah. Um, and then the envelope, uh, so this again is kind of a bit of a funky one and just playing on uh, kind of the way that current flows in and out of stuff. Um, we've got our gate, uh, we take that through this envelope type switch and this is a kind of a bit of a misnomer really because really what we're doing is we, we either have a, the normal gate signal going through to our uh, kind of comparator thing here or we take it through this little network, which uh, reduces the square wave, any kind of like long gate signal into just a single pulse. So again, you can kind of see that we feed it through this capacitor here, uh, C7, and this has got a really small value. So it will reject DC really quickly, essentially, in terms of time constant. So you end up with a very, very narrow, um, pulse, which is akin to having a trigger. 
And because this envelope setup is like an attack release, it essentially removes your attack stage and just gives you release as long as your attack time is set to zero. So it's a bit of a kind of lumpy way around it, but it it yeah you know, it kind of works. Um, we then just feed that through a diode to make sure that the current is only going positive of zero and there's no kind of negative stuff going on. And then we feed that into this. There's another comparator set up here on U3A. Um, so we're actually running this off a single rail. This this is plus nine and zero volt, uh, and we're uh, you, we are using kind of like a DC bias set up by these two resistors here uh, to kind of compare against a uh, reference level and the gate input. So it means that, say, if you put like 0.5 of a volt in to this gate, it won't trigger because the comparator won't become active. But then once you're past, I think it's now 3.5 volts, the comparator goes high and it triggers your envelope. And it's important to have this so that you don't start picking up noise at the gate input and your envelope just goes crazy all the time with you know any fluctuation that's at the gate input. Everyone happy with that? Yeah? So, I, a yeah. so a, co a comparator, so that's essentially comparing two, two inputs. When you're on it, on it. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the time you kind of, people will say like, oh, we're using a comparator here and it might just be a really, really high gain amplifier that takes any signal to the positive rail or the negative rail. So that's the thing. Here it is kind of like a true comparator because you're saying, okay, this is your this is your threshold uh, voltage set between these two resistors. And that voltage that is in the middle of that potential divider is your reference level. Is that make King sense, yeah. So it might just be worth actually because we haven't really covered this. Um, if you have a pair of resistors, uh, like the, that's ground, that's zero volt. So this is your positive voltage, and this is R1 and R2. You can use um, the different settings of your resistances here to change. Uh, the voltage that is present at the output. So this works as an attenuator. So it kind of goes back to the potentiometer ideal here. Again, any like variable resistor that has a, a wiper and two outer lugs will essentially be a potential divider like this. Um, but what we've got here is, is one that is completely static. So we're using two resistors just to give a constant voltage with reference to the uh, positive power supply. Yeah. Um, so once we've um, got a kind of like nice square edge out of this op amp, we then feed it to these two uh, pots here, these two like diode and pot networks. Um, and what VR1 and VR2 are is your attack and your decay. I think VR1's the attack and VR2 is the decay. They charge and well, they charge up this capacitor. Um, and let it kind of discharge through uh, D4. So you can see that the current will flow in the direction from the anode to the cathode through D3, and then from the anode to the cathode of D4. Yeah? And this cap is just kind of storing and, and then discharging its charge. Yeah? Does that make sense? Vaguely, yeah? Um, and it's, it's worth saying as well, like this, this value here again is one microfarad. If you wanted a quicker envelope, uh, you could change this to a lesser value. If you wanted a longer envelope, you could make it 10 microfarads. Um, but it's just talking about the, the kind of amount of charge that that will store and then let be, well, let it be charged and discharged through this network. Yeah. Is that making sense vaguely? Yeah, some confused faces, but yeah. Okay, um, and then we feed that into a buffer just to make sure that this isn't interrupted by any uh, connections to the output. So as you can see, this is this is a, an op amp with the non-inverting node connected to the source current or voltage, and then the loop is closed back from the output to the inverting input there yeah all good we put it through a diode here just to give uh, a bit of a voltage drop so this will uh, give a 0.7 volt 
voltage drop on uh, the envelope here, which kind of removes some of the bias voltage that is introduced here. And then it goes out to the output. Uh, is everyone happy with that? Yeah? Yeah. yeah? Are there any questions on any of the electronics you've seen? I know I've explained it pretty badly, but it's pretty... Um, yeah, I kind of want to want us to get on building now because it's been an hour. So, yeah. And we'll kind of cover bits and pieces as we go along. And it's, yeah, it's all interwoven anyway. So anyone baffled by anything completely? Yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. I was going to say, we've done, we've obviously done a lot of left brain here. Yeah. Do you think maybe as a palate cleanser, you could just give us five minutes of noise? Yeah, of course. Maybe yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's good. It's, it is a bit of a strange thing. It's kind of, I mean, we, we have conversations in the office that I think we don't, neither of us really truly understand once we're out of it. I don't think I do ever, but it's, it, How does it work is a big one for me. yeah, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's think about that, more. that is an amazing question because it, it, you know, that so much of this stuff you do, you do just take as a given, you know, like an op amp it's so all of these op amp packages, you know, they're individual circuits on silicon. And you never, you never think like, well, what actually is that circuit doing? You just take it as like, well, it's, it's an op amp, you know. It does this if it's set up this way. It does that if it's set up this way. So there is always a bit of kind of voodoo to it. Before you make noise, yeah. Else is the Steve? You got the second okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll just kind of give you a bit of a spectrum as to what the sim can do. So you can see kind of the resonance will control the gain of the filter a little bit as we've got in that there. So the gain of uh, that op amp stage is being changed by changing the resistance there, but it's also adding feedback to the filter so you get that kind of effect. Um, we've got LFO on FM1 so we can change the rate of the modulation there. But we can also do like really funky things with the patch bay too. So we can take maybe the pulse output. So we're listening to the saw at the moment, but pop that into VCF FM instead. And then... That is really quite strange. And try it the other way around, listen to the pulse, and try it with the saw. So you can get some pretty mad things out of this. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty aggressive. It's, again, it was nice having this thing on breadboard and then, you know, power up the speakers and test it and think, Oh, that's actually quite nice, you know, <laughs> for a little basic circuit. Um, we'll try and show you. So, for example, there, like the um, this switch uh, that switches between the shapes, that gets normal to the VCO level attenuator. Uh, and then that goes straight into the low pass filter on the normaling. I think I'm changing all the, yeah. So if I just patch something in there, you mute that connection, essentially. So we can take, uh, let's try the phase comparator. So this is uh, some of the kind of features of the 4046 chip that um, it's kind of designed to do more than just be a VCO. But it's kind of, you have to coax it into working. Oh, yeah. So, patch base, so normally is a term that you have, like in, in patch base, we have, we have like input and outputs. This patch bay is normal, so certain patch points are connected together when there's no cable connected. The by is a half normal, essentially, so it means when you connect into one of them, you disconnect that connection and take that wherever it's going. So, it 
it's actually the routing already there. So, because obviously signal flows through it without any hash fields connected, and that's the normal thing. So you can break that if you want or leave it. That being the configuration is. Uh, just trying to kick the PLL into a bit more action, but it's really what it was kind of designed for is like if you've got like a second oscillator somewhere and you want to do interesting. Uh, do people know the Core Gamma Twenty. And on the second oscillator, there's like the ring mod thing. And it's not really a ring mod. It's like an XOR gate. So that phase comparator, as we found out the other day, is actually an XOR gate. So you can kind of get similar ring mod type effects that aren't actually really a ring mod. Um, and the PLL out is really quite tricky to get anything out of. Yeah, it's really not wanting to do anything. Uh, but again, you kind of need another oscillator, really. So if I had a second Brunswick, which later we will, um, we should be able to kind of patch these all together and make a really terrible digital mess out of them. But you, you just get these interesting kind of like pulse trains that are harmonically related, and sometimes you'll get kind of different harmonics to the actual bass pitch that you're feeding it. So say if you've got a sequence and it's nice and blah, 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 and whatever, you can then bring the PLL in and you're kind of on some of the steps, you'll get different pitches that are kind of, you know, somewhere in between, uh, you know, maybe an octave below or like the fifth below and stuff like that. So, yeah. Just try more resonance. Try more resonance. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there, there you go. Is that it? <laughs> Let's try if we take the. Uh, it needs a big yeah. like swing to recognize. What it's doing is it's trying to work out the phase difference between two signals and give you a proportional a square wave that is low when the things are in phase and it needs a big step change to yeah. the phase difference. So you. Ah, oh, there we go. So you get kind of like interesting noises like that. So again, if we had a second oscillator, it'd be a bit more stable. That's just using the output and the filter at the minute. But what happens if we actually. As long as it's hot enough, yeah, it just needs to be quite high amplitude. So we're getting something out there. That's just. Yeah. It does fart sounds. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of nice and basic, but it'll do it'll do relatively tame things too. So that's with the resonance backed off, and it's a nice. That kind of thing, you know. Yeah. It's also quite, the filter is quite also level dependent. So you can hear like there, the resonance is quite wowy. And then back it off and it changes completely. And then you kind of get a wiping the window effect. And also the resonance uh, tends to kind of be active on the lower end of the filter. So at the top, it's kind of a bit harder to push. Again, if you try that diode thing, if you ever want to do that weeks after this, or maybe even today, I don't know, um, then it, it tends to be easier to drive at higher frequencies. So, 
Yeah. Um, anyone got any questions? Should we start getting the irons on and people's fingers hopefully not burnt? Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone online. If there's anyone watching, thank you for watching. Probably made no sense, but yeah. Good. Bye, Brunswick.